Hello, everyone, and welcome to our final module of Bioinformatics Bootcamp Single Cell RNA-Seq Analysis. Today, we're going to be talking about some advanced topics we weren't able to get to last time. I took your recommendations, and out of all of them, I have picked a few topics that I think will be the most interesting and the most useful to give to you today. So let's, let's go ahead and recap what we've done so far. So we started with this single cell RNA-seq downstream analysis workflow. And so far we've gone through how to load the data, do quality control, and then do normalization and scaling. We then moved on to PCA and nearest neighbor graphs, clustering and low dimensional embedding like TSNE and UMAP. Finally, we talked about some advanced topics such as cluster marker analysis, cell type identification. Um, we didn't actually get to subclustering, so I'll actually briefly touch on this today. Um, it's very simple, but it's something that I, I know is a really important point for a lot of people. We did talk about trajectories, um, cell cycle analysis, cluster DGE. We also talked about integrating data sets, um, and we talked about a couple other minor points. Okay. However, what's really important to keep in mind with all of this is that this is really a, a very small part of what is a much larger universe. And it is full of so many tools and techniques that we just had no time to get to. Many of them are landmark techniques in this field, and yet we didn't have time to get to them. Uh, why is this the case? Well, you can see from looking at um, an aggregation of published publications in the literature that mention single cell RNA sequencing that the trend has been an exponential growth in the amount of data and tools and just general insights about single cell that are being created. I mean, single cell, despite now you know, it's been what, it's been almost eight years since it was declared technology of the year in 2013, and yet it is still on a very strong upward trend. If you go and look at an aggregator like SCRNA tools, they track the single cell RNA seq tools that are available. Part of the reason is because it's so hard to keep up with them. So at this point, they say they are tracking 888 single cell RNA seq tools. And I took a look at their website. It's really great. Um, I'm actually gonna, I, I put the link here in the PowerPoint. So if you if you click this, it'll actually take you to it. Um, if you ever wanna like search for different kinds of tools that are out there or compare tools to each other, this is a fan, fantastic resource to do that with. If it ever loads, that is. Come on. <laughs> okay, th there we go. Um, Okay, so yeah, go to view the tools and you can actually search um, by a, a wide variety of categories and filters and um, you can find, I'm not sure why it's not showing me anything here. Um, okay, let's, let's pick one. <laughs> uh, it looks like maybe they, their, their strong suit might not have been web development, unfortunately. That's fine. When this is working, it's usually really useful and it allows you to find all the tools that are available and sort them by the different functions they perform. Now, going through their website, I saw some of the metrics. And it, it again, they're kind of showing this almost exponential increase since uh, even 2017 of the number of single cell tools that are available out there. Um, and again, this is just single cell RNA seq. So, really, this is not even considering things like single cell attack and, and other other tools and techniques. What's even more interesting to me is that when you look at the breakdown of published versus preprint versus not even published yet, you can see that a large number of these tools are probably currently awaiting publication. It just is kind of indicating how fast the field is moving um, and, and how at this point the roadblock is simply, it's not the time even to develop the tool, but it's, it's simply the time it takes to publish it. It's honestly amazing. 
uh, from their metrics, we can kind of see that R and Python are leading the way, where R, at this point at least, is still the uh, almost the majority of all the tools, so still indicating the relevance of R. But Python, I would say, is becoming a very strong contender. And this actually makes sense because more than in any other realm of bioinformatics, this really lends itself towards machine learning and data science, which are largely the purview of, of the Python universe. Um, and data science in the Python universe. So it does make sense that this would be the case. If we actually look at the breakdown of the different types of tools they have, we can see there is a, a large variety. Um, and most of them have something to do with just the general steps required in a single cell analysis, such as visualization, clustering, dimensionality, reduction, and you know so on and so forth. So we're today faced with the single cell universe and it can feel daunting it can feel like you have to be constantly running at breakneck speed just to stay in place um, and there's no way to get ahead of it but that's just really the impression you would get if you looked at this in its totality rather than focusing in on the tools you need to know and in on the biological questions you need to solve and so i got a lot of requests for different tools and approaches that people wanted me to go through um, but rather than do all of them, because I, I think that ultimately wouldn't serve you, and I just frankly didn't have time to learn all of them well enough to be able to actually confidently explain them, uh, I decided to focus on just a few today. But I am going to talk about, at the end, how you would learn those other techniques going forward. So today I'm going to talk about differential state analysis, pseudobulk analysis, and graph signal processing. These are three very small corners of the single cell universe, but you can do a lot with them. And in fact, they feature strongly in the literature. So let's go ahead and start with the first one. Uh, I'm actually, gonna, sorry, I'm gonna start with differential state analysis and pseudo bulk analysis because they actually go together. Um, you can use pseudo bulk analysis for differential state analysis. So, okay, so before we jump into this, does anybody have any questions that they want to ask? Anybody run into any issues so far installing Miniconda or installing Fate or Magic? Well, okay, do feel free to put it in the chat if, if you run into any issues, because um, I know that it's definitely not um, a straightforward process. And it's not the way we're used to installing things in, in our environment. Okay, so let's go ahead here. So what is differential state analysis? Let's start there. I pulled this from a, uh, a study that I found recently that does a single cell RNA sequencing on the Enterinal cortex, so this is part of the brain, um, that is implicated in Alzheimer's disease progression. And what they're looking at here is patients who have Alzheimer's disease and healthy controls. And so this was a really great study. Um, sorry, I, I'm going to have to walk that back. This was a study that produced a, a useful data set for our purposes. We're going to see actually as we go through this how it was maybe not actually a great study. But let's go ahead and start here by going and visiting the data portal that I just got this from. So that's right here where you see this link. I'm about to put this in the chat so that you can go and visit it in your browser as well. It's good to follow along here. All right. So I just put it in the chat. So we're going to go ahead to this site. Okay, so again, a single cell atlas of the enterinal cortex in human Alzheimer's disease. And thank you, thank you to um, Senlin for recommending that we look at an Alzheimer's study because actually this, this was a great test case for the differential state analysis and for a lot of the other stuff we're doing today. So one of the things that papers will often do, and it's a really good practice to get into, um, is they will use are shiny to make a interactive 
web application so that non-bioinformaticians who don't know how to code can actually explore their data themselves. So it's something that's actually really surprisingly easy to do. At some point, um, I'll do a short session on how to make something like this, but it's not gonna be in the context of this workshop, um, probably in a future session. But just know that this is actually a lot easier to make than it looks. So what they're essentially allowing you to do here is to plot the UMAP and you can actually color it by the expression of a particular gene of interest. So let's say we wanna look at FTH1. And so now we can see it automatically updates with the gene expression of FTH1. So it's just a nice feature plot. You can even change the axes to be the principal components instead. Um, and you can even change the colors. It's kind of, it, you know, it's just, I really appreciate it when um, someone who builds something like this, you know, really considers the needs of the people who are gonna use it. What's probably more interesting though, for our purposes, is when we take a look over here and we now start to annotate, uh, annotate with discrete information. So this is categorical information such as cell type, or probably more interesting, condition. And now we can see here, Alzheimer's in purple, control in green. And they seem to have some pretty strong separation. So without even having to reprocess this ourselves, we're already able to find these results, which is, I think, really nice when that is an option. But they actually went further. So they also went and they subclustered. So basically they took the individual cell types and they started to look for the subclusters within them. So they went over here. If you go to this tab here, you can go to the dimensionality reduction plots on the individual cell types. So we can start with microglia, for example. And now this is just the microglia. And we can now see the subclusters within the microglia. And basically all they did was they subset the square out object to be just microglia. And then they just ran the pipeline again to get their clusters. And that's all you're seeing here. That's all subclustering really is. And you can see if there's any association with something like, uh, you know, disease condition or with, um, you know, biological sex. Okay. So why am I showing you this? Um, well, one, to show you how you can actually make interactive visualizations for your data sets and how useful that is but also because we're going to be reanalyzing this data set in particular, and we're going to now come back later and compare our results to these and see how well what we did matches up with what they published. The last area where we're gonna do that is in this differential gene expression slash GSEA. So if you come down here to AD versus control, what they've basically done is within each cell type, they have calculated the differentially expressed genes between the Alzheimer's group and the control group. Okay, so the genes you're seeing here are the ones that are um, the strongest differentially expressed between those. And so FKBP5, um, FDR of, you know, something times 10 to the negative 41st, that's basically saying that this is a very strong marker in the microglia of Alzheimer's disease. They also looked at the gene set enrichment analysis over here to find the pathways, which were actually very interesting. If you look by the NES, you can see that the top hit was unfolded protein, which harkens back to what we talked about in lecture one, where we talked about the unfolded protein response being a strong signal in the other Alzheimer's data set that we went through at the time. They did some other things that were actually quite novel and interesting, but I'm not going to really go too much into detail here. The main thing that was useful about this be beyond the visualizations was the fact that they have a data download where you can very easily grab the um, normalized and the raw data along with the metadata, which is just a really nice thing to include. Okay, so back to differential state analysis. Now, differential state analysis is your attempt to determine the impact of a condition on gene expression within a cell type or cluster, it can actually be either. Um, but for our purposes within a cell type, and that's basically what we just showed where you're trying to see what is the impact of a condition, in this case, Alzheimer's disease 
on gene expression within, in this case, microglia. So that would be differential state analysis. So we want to ask a couple questions. First is, uh, what is the impact of Alzheimer's disease on specific cell types? And then what is the impact of Alzheimer's disease across cell types? Because as you might recall from our, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll get to that in a second, I guess. Um, as you might recall from our previous paper that we looked through, you can have pan tissue markers of Alzheimer's disease. And that's something that, that this paper that we're talking about today didn't actually do that we have the chance to now go back and do ourselves. And I'm actually gonna show you today how you would do that. Okay, so um, how are we going to actually go through this? Well, the steps are to perform a typical differential gene expression analysis using SWERAT. Um, so you can actually do this without ever leaving SWERAT, but you could also do pseudo bulk analysis or you could do a graph signal based analysis using something like MELD, which uh, we're not actually gonna show you how to do that today, but if you can do the graph signal um, part later on, you'll be able to do this as well. It's a bit more of a niche, uh, niche technique, so it's not something I thought was worth talking about today. So let's go ahead and actually start doing this. Okay, so let's jump back over to our our studio here. Make sure you've you've run all these. Make sure you've already run this. Um, and now we can go ahead and test to make sure it's working. So if if you haven't installed it yet, please make sure you do that. Let's now make sure it's working. So run these. Um, yeah, and you should get this result here. If you don't get this result, please put it in the chat. Um, uh, and we'll make sure to get to it. Um, go ahead and run this one as well, this test FATE, to make sure FATE's working correctly. Uh, Wes asked, are 81 and 82 different patients? Yes, they are different patients. Okay, so let me, let me clarify that just um, in case that was, which that was unclear, so that's my bad. Um, so in this case, these are six different patients with uh, Alzheimer's disease, and these are six different patients who are healthy controls. When you run the FATE, you should get something that looks like this. So if you don't get this, um, if you get something else, or if it gives you an error, please put that in the chat. Uh, I wanna make sure that this is working correctly for everyone. Okay, so let's go ahead and load up our libraries. Um, go ahead and run our helper functions, which we actually don't even need today. Um, right, you don't actually need this. Sorry about that. I forgot I took out Enricher. And let's go ahead and run lines uh, 68 through 78. So again, you can put your cursor anywhere on here. And what this is going to do is it's going to grab that single cell RNA-seq data, the Alzheimer's data set that we downloaded. Um, so this should be in the folder you're currently in right here. It's grabbing that. It's going to read it in. Um, it's going to create the swear out object and run our pipeline. This is a nice test of your input output speed on your computer. Keep in mind, based on the type of computer you have, this might actually really take a minute because um, it's very, very highly compressed. It's compressed from, I think, um, 260 megabytes all the way down to about nine megabytes. So it's very, very highly compressed. <laughs> Okay, so um, while this is running, um, let's talk a little bit about our data set. So we have, as we already pointed out, we have six different patients for the Alzheimer's and six for the controls. And there's actually a, a split of male and female as well. So we'll be able to visualize that in just a second um, by doing these dimension plots. 
but if you wanted to see that ahead of time, what you could actually do is simply do a table, SRT, and then the patient IDs are here. Um, sex is here, so we could do patient. And now we can see for each patient, um, ignore these, uh, I'm not really sure what these are. These probably should get removed at some point, but basically ignore those for right now. Um, you can see here that for each patient, they're either male or female. Um, and you can see that it's actually not even all the time. So we can see here, um, we've got only two female patients in the control set and um, also only two in the Alzheimer's set here. Okay. So hopefully that finished running and you can now run your, um, okay, so Henke says, um, package your namespace load failed for swear out. Our object mark vario is not exported by namespace. I really don't know what that is. Has anyone else encountered that? What version of, um, what version of R are you on? And what version of swear out are you using? The other thing that you can you can always try is just to uninstall swear out and reinstall it and hopefully that will go away. Okay, so Ramesh points out that there's actually a solution to that on swear out's GitHub page. Awesome. Um, okay, great. Wes says that won't work. Okay. Are you all on R4? Are you all on R version 4? And on swear out version 4? Okay, it's one of those then. Yeah, sometimes with um, R's package management system is sometimes a little bit messed up. Sometimes just simply restarting your R session can actually fix things. So if you want to, you can just exit this, um, open it back up, or you can come over here to restart R. That should also do it. Okay. So hopefully everyone else who didn't have that error is now at this point. And we're now able to visualize the UMAPs. Okay. So in looking at this, I think there's a few things that you can learn here, um, but a few questions that are also raised. So one of the questions that we always have with a study like this is, was there any batch effect? And so we saw that with the Ewing sarcoma tumors, right? Now we're not seeing those clear batches here where it's breaking up entirely by patient, but there do seem to be some pretty strong differences between our patients. However, it's not clear whether those are due to sex or whether they're due to genuine biological difference or whether they're due to batch. And unfortunately, it's really hard for us to effectively batch correct that away without that prior knowledge. The fortunate thing about this case is that most of what we're going to wanna to do with this data really has very little to do with getting the absolutely perfect UMAP. And it's more about your clustering, it's more about your ability to identify cell types and your ability to compare subclusters within cell types. And that we can all do without having perfectly batch corrected data. Okay. Now, this is one of those places where I would say the paper has a lot of shortcomings. Not to, um, 
not to get on a, a tirade about um, nature neuroscience, um, but if we come to the actual paper here, which is the references right here, and we go when we look down at their methods, we can see that um, the actual bioinformatics methods are, are rather sparse. And they don't really describe well what they did. They certainly don't describe it in a way that it could be reproduced. They also don't provide you with their code. If you go down to the code availability section, you'll see there is, there is nothing here. It says they'll, that if you provide a reasonable request to the authors, then you'll get the code. But as I'm sure all of you know, that's nonsense. Um, you'll probably wait six months and then they'll tell you that the original first author now works you know, somewhere else and they can't find the original code which, you know, I'm not saying that's ever happened to me, um, but I'm just saying that this is not really a responsible way to do things. <laughs> um, and nature neuroscience in general, I found is okay with less than responsible bioinformatics approaches. So this is no surprise to me that the same happened here. Now, if we actually do look at their methods, we'll see that there's no mention whatsoever of batch or batch effects. So it's not something they seem to have considered at all. Um, which is a bit confusing and worrying because it seems like something that should have come up or at least that they should have dealt with in some way. All that being said, um, hopefully you'll see the error of other people's ways and you will do better. Okay, if we actually do look at their figures though, um, we can see here that by scrolling through them and, and hopefully you're also here with me, um, if you need a link to this, I'm, I'm happy to send this again. So actually, let me send this in the chat. Okay. Um, you'll see that it's pretty much all characterization. Um, there's really very little quality control at all that was done. And because of that, it, it's really hard to trust the results, especially where they differ from other previous studies that had a lot more quality control that went into them, such as the one that I presented for you in the first module. Okay, which they're actually directly comparing to here. So it's not important that you read the whole thing or that you know everything that's going on here. I just wanna take this as a jumping off point for us today. All right, so there are a few things that are concerning and we've already discussed them. Um, they have to do with imbalances with the sex of the patients, uh, potential batch effects that were not corrected, that you can see at the patient level and just generally a lack of, of quality control. So let's now go ahead to our differential state analysis. So the first method you can use to do differential state analysis is simply to use Swerot's built-in find markers command. So keep in mind that our goal here is to find the impact of a condition, in this case, Alzheimer's disease, on gene expression within a cell type. So let's say that we want to do that with microglia and comparing Alzheimer's to controls. So the first thing we can do is, uh, is assign the cell types as the identities. And then we can use the find markers command saying ident1 is AD, ident2 is CT, so that's Alzheimer's and control, group by batch condition, Okay, and then subset ident is mg. So group by the batch condition refers to ad and ct. So when we colored by batch condition, that was where we got ad and ct. So ad and ct are factor levels of the batch condition column, okay? Now the identities are now our cell types. So when we subset ident to mg, this is just shorthand for microglia, we're now going to take the cells that have the microglia identity, and then we're going to compare AD versus control. So I know I'm kind of belaboring the point here. I just wanted to be very clear how you do this and how this is working. And there you go. All right, so we get our results and we can see here, if we look at our top hit, FKBP5, Go back to our, uh, yeah, microglia, top hit, FKBP5. So we're at least seeing something similar. There are certainly differences. And um, because they didn't really give their methods, we don't really know how they did their, uh, their analysis. But 
we can probably assume that it was by a relatively similar approach. Okay. Now, what if what your goal was, was to find in every cell type, what genes identify Alzheimer's disease specifically. So basically identifying the Alzheimer's disease markers within every individual cell type. Well, you could set up an L apply. What that's going to do is it's going to loop through all the cell types. So you put that as the first function here, the, uh, the different cell types that are in your data set. It's gonna loop through them and it's going to apply a function to each of them. And it's gonna return a list. So the function it's going to apply is it's going to find the markers. It's going to do a little bit of wrangling here, get the ones that are significant, and then pull those out as a vector of genes. Now, notice we're only doing the positive markers here. So we're only finding markers that positively identify Alzheimer's. And that's just because that's the question we want to ask is what are the positive markers of Alzheimer's disease? Okay, then we're done. Now, if we take a look at our res list here, we can see that it is a list containing those different cell types and character vectors of the genes that are significantly overexpressed in Alzheimer's disease in that cell type. So these are corresponding here. Now, we don't care too much about doublet. We don't care too much about unidentified, and we don't care about endos. There weren't really enough cells in the endothelial population. You can see it's a very small population here. Um, there weren't enough for us to really care about them. So we're gonna take those three out. And we can do that by just running this line on 107 here. Now we've got res list final, it's just these five, oligo, astrocyte, oligodendrocyte, progenitor cells, neurons, and microglia. Now there's a few ways that you can identify these pan tissue markers. Um, the easiest is probably just to do a Venn diagram comparing these gene lists to each other. So let's go ahead and, and run that here. Now Venn diagram doesn't easily return back a plot that you can plot in your RStudio interface. So it's, it's honestly just easier to output it to a PNG file, which is what we've done here. If you take a look at your, whoops, if you take a look at your folder, you should now see this PNG sitting there. And we can now see what were the pan tissue markers. And in fact, we identify nine apparently that are pan tissue markers of all five cell types. So hearkening back to our original paper where they identified pan tissue markers as well. Okay. So what are these genes? Well, we can actually get that list easily by running the calculate.overlap function. So this again comes from the Venn diagram package. That's going to make uh, what is in essence kind of a, a non-user friendly list here of all the overlaps in the data set. The very first one though is, is actually the one that contains the, the genes that were overlapped in all cell types. So we know that because it's got nine and we looked at the picture and there were nine that were in all of them. And I wish I had a more uh, rigorous way to tell you to get this, but this is the way I always do it myself. So we can pull that out. That's A31. We can pull that out and we can see what those genes were. Okay. All right, I wanna ask a question. It's a bit of a challenge question. Does anybody see something here in this list of genes we pulled out that indicates some bias that's due to sex. Does anybody uh, see anything that might indicate that? Yeah, yeah, exist, exactly. Yeah, so that is, that is such a strong and well-known marker of, of a sex-specific bias in any sort of sequencing data. So when you see that, usually that should be a cause for a, a moderate degree of alarm. Um, so let's go ahead and let's actually plot some of our top hits here. Let's plot Lingo 1. We're going to do a violin plot here. And this is, I've not shown you how to do this before. I actually think this is really nice. You'll be able to uh, see AD versus control across cell types in one nice violin plot. All right. 
So now we can see here um, astrocytes, um, you know, endothelial microglia. In pretty much all cases, lingo one seems to be expressed more highly in the Alzheimer's disease group compared to the control. Pretty cool. Let's now look at exist. So, right, this might be a bit concerning. So for those of you who don't know, exist is specifically a marker of, of female sex, right? It's specific because it's it's a gene that's involved in X inactivation. So uh, males are not going to express this. We can see this if we look at the violin plot. Instead of splitting by batch condition, we split by sex. Right, so we can see very strong differences between the female and male cells with respect to exist. So we just talked about this a minute ago, but um, if you take sex and batch condition and you look at the percentage of each sex that has each condition, we can see that um, there is a bias here. 70% of the female, 70% uh, of the female cells were Alzheimer's disease, only 30% were control. It's slightly more even with the males, but still not great. This is one area where you might want to actually employ some downsampling because you might want to have a more even distribution. The problem that we encountered earlier, which um, wasn't actually part of the script, so I can, I'm not even sure where I put that. Uh, I guess I took it out. Um, the problem we encountered earlier, which I'm now gonna put in the chat, was if we do table um, sex and then patient ID, I had this backwards, sorry. Um, the problem that we actually had in the first place was that there really weren't all that many um, female control cells to begin with compared to the male ones. So if you want to downsample, then you're downsampling typically to like the, the, the one that is the lowest, which doesn't give you a lot left to work with. Certainly not ideal. Seems like the kind of thing that would have come up in a review, or at least in their methods. Anyways, all right. Okay, so let's go ahead now and, um, oh, right, one more, one more thing you can do. So rather than doing a Venn diagram, you can actually do something called an upset plot. Who here has actually heard of an upset plot before? They're kind of like a newfangled visualization approach. Oh, right. That's right. You did. Right. I totally forgot. Wes did actually show one of these in, um, in, in the lecture he gave. Okay. Well, Wes, you, uh, you ruined the surprise. Dang it. So, so upset plots. Let's, let's take a look here. An upset plot is going to give you in a case where you have um, sets that you want to intersect, it'll show you for every intersect how many items were in that intersect. So basically what we're looking at here is, for example, the genes that were found as AD markers in astrocytes and oligodendrocytes, well, we found 34 of those. Okay, so that's basically what you're seeing here. This is very similar to a Venn diagram, but this is actually in many ways a superior visualization approach because it's much easier to interpret it at a glance. And they are called upset plots. There's a really fantastic package called um, Super Exact Test where they'll do upset plots and then you can actually overlay on top of that the Fisher's Exact Test p-values to add just another layer of information to it. So you can actually see not only how large each intersect was, but how significant that intersect is. Really cool, definitely recommend it. Okay, so this is probably the way I would do it, um, but there's another approach called pseudo bulk. Before I move on to that, does anybody have any questions about what I just did here? Hengi, were you able to get the, um, is it working now? 
still not working. Okay. Um, okay. All right. So let's, let's do one thing at a time here. So, um, so Hengi, would you mind, is, is it the same area error that you had before? Okay. Can you post the error? What version of R are you on? What version of R do you have? And what version of swear out do you have just to make sure I, I, I know, cause I, I don't think if, yeah. So that is the same error you had before. That's the um, objects. You have R4. What what version of swear out are you on? So if, um, yeah, so for anyone who doesn't know, if you go over here to your packages panel and you go and you search whatever package you're looking for here, so I'll search swear out, you can see the version that you have right here. Okay. Uh, well, hopefully, yeah. No, I'm I'm gonna get to that in just a second. Okay. So yeah. All right. Wes says if you're actually using Venn diagrams and not Euler, upset gets rid of your zeros. So yeah, that's actually a, a fantastic point. Um, it's part of the reason it's like kind of hard to interpret Venn diagrams is because like it appears like there's an overlap here, but there actually isn't. Um, there's actually a zero here. So even though when you draw it, it looks like there's an overlap there, there really isn't. You can draw an Euler diagram. Um, yeah, well, okay, but uh, yeah, you can use Euler diagrams. I've just had terrible luck getting them to solve because when, when they have to solve the visualization, sometimes they get messed up and stuff will end up like way outside of the visualization. Um, where it's not supposed to be. I, I found it to be touch and go sometimes with, at least with the Euler D package or whatever it's called, Euler package actually. So, all right. So the package that does the Fisher's exact test is called super exact test. So yeah, and it's just this one here, super exact test. Really fantastic, um, highly recommend it. I'm gonna put this in the chat. And yeah, the, the Euler package, unless you know of another Euler package, the one that, I, that I've that i used, Oi, how do you spell it? Euler, yeah, that's how you spell it. Yeah, this is the one that I think I pretty much always use. They have a Shiny app now, no way. All right, um, I just have to see it. All right, so this is the Euler package. Um, I'm gonna put this in the chat as well. And so the issue I'm talking about is that if you have more than three overlaps, if you have four or five overlaps, um, it has to solve the visualization to represent them proportionally. And sometimes that solving fails. Um, anytime I've really wanted to use an Euler plot for something, it's typically failed. So that's why I'm a little bit biased. Um, so what's nice here, it looks like they actually have a, a Shiny app where you can run this in your browser without having to do it in R. Again, Shiny apps, very easy to make um, comparatively to other web applications um, and uh, doesn't require you to learn anything except for R and they, they can be nice for displaying your data. Someday I will show people how to make one. Okay. So. Um, now, Hengi, and you said you also tried, you also tried quitting our studio and, and signing and, and loading it up again. Okay. Yeah. Did you try uninstalling swear out and reinstalling it? So let me show you how to do that since that's not something that everyone might know. Um, I'm not actually going to do it because I, I need swear out right now. But if you go over here to this X on the right hand side where it says remove package, um, you can you can automatically do this here. You can also do, I think, remove dot packages swear out. Yeah. 
Unfortunately, this is this is the aspect of R um, that is lovingly referred to as package hell, and it is certainly my least favorite part of this language. Um, I really hope that works out. Apparently, it's solved on the development branch. So, for anyone watching this later, um, hopefully, that's going to be a solution. I'll, I'll keep you updated in the lecture video if we end up solving it. And if we don't solve it in the lecture video, I'll, I'll see if I can wrangle up a solution later and post it in the web in the web page. Yeah. So Ramesh uh, has a really good point. If you want to install something from GitHub from a particular branch of a GitHub repository, you can use remotes or dev tools, um, install underscore GitHub, and then you can do this ref equals develop. Uninstall will not resolve. Is there an error that like a specific error you're getting? If you type remove dot packages swear on, what does that like does it are you able to actually remove it? Okay, so you, you can remove it, but you're saying when you reinstall it, the error is still there? Okay. Well, I'm really sorry about this. That, that sounds like a really tough uh, bug. Yeah. Um, well, okay, so hopefully, even if you can't follow this now, um, you'll be able to watch this later and, and follow it. But yeah, I'm, I am really sorry about that. That sounds really frustrating. Okay, so um, just for the sake of time, I am gonna move on here. So, all right, the next step is to actually do this with pseudobulk analysis using something called muscat. So this is a package that just essentially automates the process of pseudobulk analysis, but as you'll see in a second, it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, all right, so first thing we're gonna do is convert our square out object to a single cell experiment. Then we're going to run this prep SCE function. And all that's gonna do is it's going to get everything labeled correctly and into the correct form to run aggregate data. Now aggregate data is simply going to take for each patient, it's going to take all the cells that that patient had within each cell type and aggregate some together the uh, cell expression profiles, the raw counts. It's gonna sum them together into one expression profile. So essentially this is why we call it pseudo bulk because you are trying to take single cell and turn it into bulk RNA-seq. Um, but you have the added benefit of being able to divide it up by cell type. So we're, we're gonna run this here. It's done. Um, if we take a look at what this produced, it's, um, yeah, let's go actually down here to assays, data, list data. And now we can see we have um, for each of these, there's a matrix with 14 columns. So we went from having about 13,000 columns to having 14. And if you'll recall, we had 14 patients. That's because within each cell type, we sum together all the cells for each patient into one aggregated expression matrix. So if we take a look at this one here, we'll take a look at the, uh, the astro site one. It's actually line 145 we can see what that looks like. So far fewer zeros. Then that's just because we, we smashed together all of these cells uh, for each patient within each cell type. All right, so does anybody have any questions about how the pseudo bulk is working? Okay. Now, once you have everything in pseudo bulk form, you can actually just run typical differential expression analysis on it. We're not actually gonna do that here. We're going to continue to use Muscat, um, but we'll actually see that behind the scenes, that's actually what they're doing. First thing that we can do because of the built-in functionality in this package, we can just plot an MDS plot. So MDS is um, in many ways, very similar to UMAP or, PCA, it's a method of dimensionality reduction. 
and it produces a nice 2D embedding of the data. So if we zoom in on this, we can see here um, each of our cell types and then each of our 14 samples within each cell type. So for example, if we focus here on all dendrocytes, we can see the 14 patients who are either Alzheimer's or control, and we can see where they fall in this um, multi-dimensional uh, you know, MDS embedding. It's kind of nice. You can see that they're still separating by cell type pretty effectively. Okay, so uh, the final step is to actually run the differential state analysis here, line 151. And this is actually behind the scenes calling a, uh, an R package called Edge R, which is a very popular package for doing differential gene expression analysis. And so what does this produce? It produces a list that includes table data fit and args. If you actually want your Edge R objects, that's here in data. So you can get it here. Um, but we don't need them. We'll just take the results tables. So um, again, for each cell type, we ran the differential gene expression between our Alzheimer's and our control. Um, and we can actually take a look here at our microglia. So let's, let's go ahead and grab the microglia data table and take a look. So uh, it's not sorted yet by p-value or anything, so we can sort it by p-value. And now we can see what were the top overexpressed and underexpressed genes. So uh, again, we see FKBP5, so that's a great sign. Um, but it does look even more different from what the authors reported. And the p-values are certainly far less significant than we saw or than they saw. So they probably did not use this particular approach. Again, we don't know how they did it, but they probably didn't do this. Uh, Jingyu asks, can we extract BAM or BW file for pseudobulk? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, you wouldn't really, it would kind of defeat the purpose in my, in my opinion, it would defeat the purpose of doing a pseudobulk analysis on single cell. Unless what you're trying to do is to just prove that as bulk RNA-seq, you see the same things, right? So if, you're, if your goal is to, and actually in that paper I presented in module one, they did this. If your goal is simply to show um, Alzheimer's versus control, do we see the same genes coming up that we saw at the single cell level? Basically just validating that in the bulk form, we would see the same thing. Then sure, if it's kind of a quality control measure, then sure. Uh, but the purpose of doing it like this is that you can actually start by identifying the cell types. And then once you've identified the cell types, then you can do your pseudo bulk analysis within each cell type. That's the real benefit of doing it like this, of doing the pre-processing and swear out and everything like that first. Because this is, is as if what you had done was you had taken the cells from the patient brains, flow sorted them, and then did bulk RNA-seq on the flow sorted cells. And I mean, by flow sorted, I mean like separating the neurons from the astrocytes from the microglia and then done your bulk RNA-seq and then done your differential gene expression. You get the same thing by doing it this way, or at least you get close. At least in theory, you get close. I'm gonna walk that back a little bit. I don't typically do this. Um, it's just not what I found to be um, a, it's not that it's not a popular technique. It's just one that I found it produces results that can be kind of difficult to interpret. So, I mean, looking at this here, we can see that there was really almost no significant results. Um, but we know that there is a difference between Alzheimer's and control. We're just not able to see it, probably because we introduced a lot of variance when we looked at things on the patient level. So that might have actually overpowered any real signal we could have been able to see. Um, at some level, you'll have to demonstrate why the way you did it is the correct one, but I, I've never really found this to be an attractive approach. All right, so we can now do this with, um, oh, sorry, we can now extract for every cell type, we can extract the significant genes. And basically this is what we did earlier, and we can now get our Venn diagram. So Venn diagram, only one this time was shared. So kind of some underwhelming results here. And we can go ahead and grab it and we can see that one was Lingo1. 
and we can do our upset plot as well. Okay, so before we jump into graph-based um, signal processing, which is definitely gonna take the rest of our time, uh, does anybody have any questions? Okay. Hopefully, um, Senlin and, and Teodora. Hopefully, this was um, this this uh, was useful, given the things that I know that you would wanted to see me go through. I was hoping I could kind of kill two birds with one stone here. Okay. Okay. Great. So, Henke says installing the development version of SwearOut resolves the problem. So, awesome. Um, I'm gonna make a note of this and I will put this on, um, I will put this on the website later for anyone else who runs into the problem. Thank you for going through all that. I, I think honestly being willing to troubleshoot stuff is what ultimately um, helps everyone. Okay, so okay, so let's now talk about graph signal processing. So this is an approach to single cell RNA seq and just uh, manifold learning in general that is largely being pioneered by the the Krishna Swami group at Yale. Uh, I've actually had a chance to work with them a little bit and to talk with them a little bit about the tools they're developing. And they're a really fantastic resource for understanding how graph-based signal processing works and why it is in many ways a superior way to go about analyzing single cell RNA-seq. They also do um, deep learning-based approaches, but I would say that their bread and butter at this point seems to be the sort of graph-based approach. So um, I'm gonna start by introducing the general concept from this paper, visualizing structure and transitions in high dimensional biological data. This is otherwise known as the FATE paper. This is where they developed the technique called FATE, P-H-A-T-E. If you haven't heard about it before, um, it's really great you're being introduced to it here because it's a really fantastic approach for visualizing uh, high dimensional data in many ways superior to even UMAP and certainly superior to TSNE and PCA. So the way it works is that we start with a data set. So um, actually, I want to ask a question just to see if anyone knows this. Does anybody notice anything odd or unusual about our, our matrix here? Anything that's perhaps different from how we typically represent a matrix like this? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So Theodora says, uh, gene and cell are inverted. Yes, they are inverted, transposed, yeah. Does anybody know why that is? Does anybody have a guess as to why this applied mathematics and machine learning based group did this? I'm just curious if anyone, if anyone knows. Wes, you should, you should be bold. You should say, I'm wrong probably 80% of the day. So don't worry about being wrong.
Okay, so Wes says in number based machine learning matrices are fantastic. The long form data arrangement we use in the RDGE matrix swaps those conditions. Swaps. Could you, um, maybe if you're willing to unmute, maybe you could clarify what you mean by that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's that's no that's that's no problem. So, um, I'll show you. I'll show you. So, if we go to um, any sort of machine learning kind of um, topic, you know, in, in anywhere in the literature, really. So let's let's go even back to our um, PCA visualization online that we did. So um, we did here Satosa PCA visually explained. And I think it'll it'll become pretty qu uh, quickly apparent how why they did this and what that implies about how bioinformatic how bioinformaticians are as people. Um, okay, so we've got here a data matrix. Um, ignore ignore these colored bars. They really they don't matter. It's the same thing without them. So we've got a data matrix here where you've got. Um, Well, I thought this was going to be a good example, but I apparently messed this up. All right. Okay. The reason is because of this. Let's look at Iris for a second. <laughs> Go to Old Faithful here. Um, view Iris. This is the data set that we often use for machine learning. What, what do we notice about the columns? These are features. Columns are features. Rows are observations. And in fact, all throughout machine, machine learning, all throughout data science, this is pretty much always true. Columns, features, rows, observations. Okay, so by that logic, when we look at our, our single cell matrix, if we look here at uh, SRT assays, we'll look at, uh, we'll look at our counts and we'll look at the um, first 10 rows and columns. Okay, that was apparently not the right way to do this. Let's do first four. Let's do first three, two. Uh, okay, Hengi says, why is beta zero x zero, beta one x one, these genes are x and we want to predict y. The mo model might not be linear, but the idea is the same. That's, uh, yeah, that's probably a, a fair way to put it. That's probably a fair, a fair way to put it, I would say. Um, because why, well, okay, no, no, that's just, you're, you're actually, sorry. Okay, so the reason is because of this. Um, when we look at our matrix here, our features, which are our genes, are on the rows. Our observations, which are our cells, are on the columns. Again, with, with something like iris, features are columns, observations are rows. But in for some reason, all of the work we do with RNA-seq and microarray and that sort of thing, for some reason, our observations are actually the columns instead of the rows, which makes machine learning people and data science people very angry. Which is why um, people like the Krishnaswamy group impose their um, their system on us. It's not even their system. It's the system everyone else but us has. Um, essentially forcing us to adopt what are good practices for data science. Now, I, I'm, I want to ask now, does anyone know why the rows are genes instead of the columns being genes? Um, but for the sake of time, unfortunately, I, I'm just going to tell you. Um, so the reason is because of microarray. 
right? Because the way we represent microarray data is having the rows as the probes, right? Um, so that's how we got into, I guess, this, this idea of rows being features rather than rows being observations like it is in the rest of data science. Or at least that's the reason I've heard explained to me. There might be other reasons, but that's the one I've heard. Okay, so all that being said, um, let's go ahead and show you how this is working. Okay, so essentially what's going on here is they've got cells by genes, so observations by features. They've got the data in kind of an idealized form here. And what they want to do first is actually calculate distances. So we want to know cell to cell distances. This is just Euclidean distance. But actually, when we do this in reality, we're going to start with a PCA step. So we're going to do PCA, and then we're going to calculate the distances in PCA space. Um, so this is just a common practice for, as we've already talked about, denoising the data set and um, cutting down on the computational time required to do the analysis. The next step is to convert your distances into affinities. So um, what is the difference between a distance and an affinity? Well, an affinity is a nonlinear representation of distance. And basically, the closer you are, the more affinity you have. So the smaller the distance, the greater the affinity. And you can see that represented here. But it's a nonlinear relationship. What is the function of a kernel in manifold learning? A kernel is a function that converts distance to affinity. That is what a kernel is in manifold learning. So Gaussian kernels are an example of this. So we've got a kernel here, and I think they actually use a Gaussian kernel, and it converts distances to affinities. It's just a function that does that. So why do we do this? There's a lot of reasons, but the main argument from people who develop these techniques is that nonlinear relationships are more representative of true biology. And you can demonstrate that a lot of different ways. A lot of people have. But essentially, that's how we get to this point. And in fact, things like TSNI and UMAP also rely on that assumption to a large degree. Nonlinear relationships are better representative of true biology. And so that's why this is not, a, this is not linear here. The relationship, the relationship between affinity and distance is not a straight line. OK, so I know I'm about to go through a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm hoping just to give you the intuition as to how this is working. So why do we develop these affinities? Well, it's because the next thing we want to do is we want to now calculate probabilities. And specifically, we want to calculate diffusion probabilities. So this is based on an idea that you're probably all familiar with of diffusion, as in you know, um, a solute in a solvent, um, or as in um, you know, the modeling of how cells progress in a dish, how they move in a dish. Essentially, the basic concept here is that if we want to start at this point where this red dot is, and we want to walk to somewhere, el somewhere else on the graph, what is the likelihood that we'll be able to walk to that place in t steps or t time, t being here in the equation? So basically, we're asking um, how, how likely is it that I can go from here to here in five steps, for example, five steps walking along that graph five random steps, sorry, I should say five random steps in any direction. How likely is it that that will land me here? And then how likely is it that it will land me here? Very unlikely as it turns out. So the reason we do this is because um, Marco this is Markovian, um, I guess you could say Markovian mathematics. Um, and basically what we're trying to do here is instead of dealing with this as even affinities or distance, we're trying to deal with it as a set of probabilities. And once we do that, we can use what is kind of an interesting distance-based approach called the informational distance to actually determine how close, based on those probabilities, any two cells are to each other, which can be encoded. And we can actually you know, project that to do a 2D embedding, or we can use it for other interesting things. In fact, there's no end to the interesting things we can do with that kind of information. But the, the, I hope you get the intuition here. The main part that we want to focus on is this here. Basically, this is the um, primary thing that makes their approach special, is the fact that they're dealing with diffusion probabilities rather than 
distance or affinities or anything like that. Okay. So I think you'll see in a second why this gets them to a place that is actually more interesting than we get to with something like a UMAP, a TSNI, or a PCA. There's two tools that they built on top of this approach. The first being magic and the second being fate. Well, actually there's, there's more than this, but these are the two that are probably most popular today in the literature. So we've actually mentioned magic before, um, but I, I actually first, just for the sake of being able to visualize this, first I wanna talk about fate. Okay, so before before we jump into that, um, does anybody have any questions? I know this is this is a pretty um, sorry, whoops, this is a pretty heavy subject. Okay, so if you want to dig into this more, um, yeah, I, I know it's it's. I really just want to give you the intuition here because the math, even I can't do the math. Um, if you go to their website, so I I think the it's linked in the PowerPoint, but I'll also put it in the chat here. Um, so this is Smita Krishnaswamy's website. Um, whoops. There it is. I'm going to put this in the chat here. They've got lots of um, educational videos, and there's actually a fantastic lecture that was given by the first author on the paper I'm about to talk about, where he goes through the math um, at, at kind of a, a shallow level, goes through the math and the intuition behind how it's working in much more detail than I have time to talk about here. So they've got great workshops. They've got great um, lectures. So I would check those out. Um, this is a really good one as well. But yeah, okay. So let's just say for the sake of argument now, we've got our probabilities, we've got our informational distance, and we're now ready to embed this using fate. So what is fate doing? Well, let's actually take a look at fate now. And to examine it, we're gonna use what's called a toy data set. So this is an artificial tree. This is what the artificial tree looks like in its, in its true state. This is what it actually looks like, right? So we know because it's artificial, we know the ground truth here. That's what that's called. Now, if we take the artificial tree, we take the data from it and we embed it using just simple principal component analysis, we can actually see something interesting here, which is that PCA has effectively captured the global relationships in the sense that blue and purple are all the way on one side and green and slightly lighter green are all the way on the other. And then there's this nice crossbar here with orange and yellow. So these large scale um, relationships were captured pretty effectively, but we don't even see this branch. We don't see any of these branch points. So we're missing the fine grained structure of the data. Okay, now let's look at TSNI. TSNI, is able to capture local relationships. And we can see here these branch points are being captured. But where TSNI falls short, and UMAP has the same problem, don't let anyone try to fool you. Um, UMAP also has this problem. Uh, it's not good at finding global relationships and local relationships, right? So it's found local relationships, but the global relationships are kind of missing. Green should be over here. It shouldn't be floating by itself. Purple should be over here. And other green should also be over here. So we're, we're missing that. This is where fate demonstrates its superiority. So what fate has done is it's learned both the local relationships, so these branch points and other local features, but it's also learned global relationships. So how does green and green relate to the larger arc of this tree? How do they how do they fit in? It's really effective at showing that. And it almost fully recapitulates our original tree. So this is the kind of thing that fate excels at. Now, how is it able to do this? Well, again, it all comes back to these diffusion probabilities and the informational distance. Because of the way that we're doing this, we are not 
like Tsning and UMAP are doing, we are not saying in versus out. We're not, we're not essentially forcing the graph to be partitioned at various points. It's, they're not actually intending to do that, but that is what happens based on the number of neighbors that you use and the parameters that you put in. Um, and that's why the way that this is working is actually able to capture both the, the I guess I should say that the global relationship is able to capture the overall affinities and the overall dis diffusion probabilities. And then you've got information distance between everything and everything else. Um, but also you still have good local relationships because of, again, the affinity approach that are used by UMAP and T-STING. So that was a, a terrible um, watering down of how these are working and um i would love to at some point talk more about this but i just don't have time and hopefully that's enough to give you the intuition of how this is better in many ways compared to pca tsni and umap here's a great example so this is actual single cell data from the embryoid body and basically you've got embryonic stem cells in here and then you've got you know a, a transition outwards towards terminal differentiation so you have the full gamut within this embryoid body. Um, and what's really interesting is you can see, again, PCA captures global relationships very well. Oh, sorry, there's, there's time here. So how long has it been um, growing for, right? So less time means it's more uh, embryonic and stem-like. More time means it's more differentiated. PCA captures that transition beautifully, but it misses the fine-grained structures. It misses how is, you know, um, the mesoderm different from the ectoderm, right? It misses things like that. But it does capture the larger transition that's occurring. TSNI is effectively capturing those different populations and splitting them up from each other. Very good. But it fails to capture the larger arc of the transformation. Fate, on the other hand, gives you the best of both worlds. It's effectively able to realize that there is a large global transition occurring and that there are subpopulations of interest within it. So again, um, really impressive technique. And this all comes back to the um, all comes back to the diffusion probabilities, informational distance. And then um, actually the last step is they're just embedding that informational distance with multi-dimensional scaling. So that's what actually produces the final embedding. So to summarize, fate is great at finding local and global structure, but it also has an assumption to make, which is that you have a, a, a well-connected graph or a graph that should be relatively well-connected. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, you know, in the case of our artificial tree, literally every point connects to every other point. And you have a reasonable expectation that when you represent this, you should see everything being connected. Um, embryoid body, same thing. You, you should expect there to be reasonable connections between most points and most other points. However, this will break down if you talk about an adult tissue like the brain, where you've got um, diametrically opposed cell types and cell states, cell states in there. That's where fate can start to break down a little bit. It's really much better at finding transitions. Okay. So the next one is magic. Magic, because you already know about how fate works, magic will be a little bit easier. So magic um, came out in, I think, 2018. Um, so, oh, okay, so Henke, okay, Henke asked a great question, which is immune cells will not work by fate then? It's not that they won't work, okay? But the most effective way to use fate would probably be to use it to reconstruct some sort of change that is occurring. So for example, if you stimulate them with interferon, if you like stimulate um, like T, I, I guess T cells get stimulated with interferon. If you stimulate them with interferon um, and then you look at the transition which occurs, that might be a more interesting way to use fate because um, it's not that you can't use it. It's just sometimes it's uninformative. If you don't have the ability to reasonably expect things to be in a, transition. Yeah, time series is a good application as well. Absolutely. That's probably the one I've used it for most at this point is time series. Okay. So we've already mentioned this before. Um, we talked about how there's sparsity in single cell data, but magic is an approach to basically share information between neighbors and impute missing values. 
the way it works is actually, it, it should probably feel a bit familiar at this point because um, this is actually what we just talked about. You've got your original data, you get your distances, you use a kernel to convert them to affinities. You do your Markov normalization and exponentiate Markov matrix. These two steps, four and five, are actually the same thing we just did here. So this is actually in one step, both of these. So you're getting your, your diffusion probabilities with your T steps um, exponent. And then once you're at this point, all you have to do is actually just multiply the matrix, uh, matrices, uh, sorry, multiply the matrices, your, your um, Markov matrix and your original data. And that actually produces your imputed data, imputed data matrix. Um, and so, yeah, it's actually a bit more straightforward than fate. So that's why I wanted to start with fate, get you used to the sort of complexity of this, and then now show you a bit easier and, and simpler way to apply it. Um, okay, so what does this actually look like? Well, if we go to their paper, we can see here that as they up the value of T, so basically allowing you to consider more steps, more neighbors, greater diffusion probabilities, you're able to get um, better relationships between, for example, they're looking at two genes here. So by the time T equals seven, you can see that there's actually quite a relationship between these, as opposed to everything being basically zero in both. Okay, and we're going to actually do this in a minute here, so you'll get a chance to see. So um, magic is great because it's able to impute missing values using data diffusion, but it makes the assumption that neighbors are informative, which might not always be the case. So use it cautiously and really try to sanity check. If you ever do use it, try to sanity check it. I typically only use magic if I've got fluidine data or if I've got some very like high depth smart seek or something like that. I have never used it on 10x genomics before. Um, I've never felt confident doing that. So um, do what you feel like you can defend, um, but just know that using this on 10x might work, might be harder to defend. <laughs> Uh, Ramesh asked, would this work for a heterogeneous data set? It should, as long as you've got sufficient counts to begin with, it should. And the reason being that, um, you know, we're only, we're only sharing information here between uh, neighbors. So in theory, these neighbors here are all belong to the same cell type. So if you've got PBMCs, maybe these neighbors are all monocytes. Then in theory, sharing information between them is okay because they should all have the same genes in the first place, or at least be similar in the first place. So it's fine to do this with, uh, again, the limitation is um, how, much, how much you had going in, right? How, much, how, how deep was your sequencing to begin with? How many dropouts did you have to begin with? Because if you've got a lot of dropouts, it almost doesn't matter um, how robust your cell type identification or anything else is. Magic is probably going to overestimate its when it imp, uh, when it imputes the missing values. But yeah, heterogeneous data should work just fine if you've got enough read depth. Okay, so let's actually let's actually do this now in R. I'm going to go kind of quickly through this because I want to be respectful of your time and I want to explain the uh, the final project. So we just talked about the issue um, of, of sparsity with magic. So let's go ahead and run this first line here so you can see that displayed. So we're doing a feature scatter and we're comparing the expression of exist and lingo one, two of our top genes from our previous analysis. We can see that maybe there is some kind of relationship between them here, but there's so many zeros that it's really not clear. So what we're going to do now is we're going to just straight up run magic on this. We're going to see if that changes anything. So it takes a minute to run. Um, the first step with magic is to, um, oh no, I actually made a mistake here. I, I'm really sorry about this. I'm about to put this in the chat, but basically what you need to do is transpose this first. Okay, so do transpose this first. I'm gonna put this in the chat. See, even I will make this mistake because it's so different from how I typically operate. All right, so now it says 13,000 something cells, 10,000 something genes. That's actually the correct number now. So I just put it in the chat. 
just make sure you transpose it first. Because again, the rows have to be the observations, the columns have to be the features. And this will take a minute. Uh, like I said, it starts by calculating PCA. It does a K nearest neighbors search. Um, it does affinities, does uh, graph and diffusion. And so this is the part that I was just talking about with the um, where it uh, finds the probabilities. Um, and then it does the imputation at the end. <clears throat> All right, so now we've got our, our magic data, okay? Um, we can we can look at it like a list here, and we can see that the result is a list as well. With um, for every gene, they've got <clears throat> um, all the new values for all the cells. You can actually get this as a data frame. Um, the easiest way to deal with this, though, probably is is simply to do this set assay data um, slot equals data new data as matrix data magic results. And um, something else that I, I now realize why I didn't realize I needed to do this because I never transposed it back. So it was kind of like a transpose of a transpose. So let's actually put this back here, add the transpose again. Um, so now if we look at our SRT magic, uh, swear out magic, we can see correct number of cells. So thir 13,000 correct number of features as well. And basically what we did was we took our original swear out object, we substituted our data, our original data, which was just the log transform counts that was sparse. And we, we substituted that with our new magic results. Okay, so let's go ahead, run our pipeline on swear out magic now, or SRT magic. So you can treat it the exact same way you treated um, your original swear out objects. It's just now it should be better because because of the magic. Okay. So now we're going to compare the UMAP from our swear out magic and our and our original swear out. Let's go ahead and see what difference that made. Okay. So on the left, we have our magic version. And on the right, we have our original version. Um, as you might notice, the uh, batch effect might be a little bit more apparent now, but that's all right. Okay. But the main thing we want to do with this really is to, um, okay, so Wes made a good point, which is any particular RAM warnings people should consider before running magic? Probably, probably. Um, that's, a good, that's a good idea for any sort of single cell actually. But yeah, when, when I run magic, I've got plenty of RAM, but if you've got less than eight gigs of RAM, you might not be able to run it. Um, did anyone run into an error or a warning about RAM? Did anyone's RStudio session crash? Okay, something that might help um, is by clearing old old objects in memory you don't need anymore. Um, so, you know, I, I've shown you how to do this before, but basically if you wanna remove an object from memory, let's say we wanna move data, or remove data magic, it's pretty easy for us to do that here and then run the garbage collector. So that's just GC. And so now I've just freed up a little bit of memory on my machine. So, like that, I just put it in the chat. Well, anyways, so the thing that we really wanna do though, is we wanna see how well can we now correlate our genes? Cause that's, that's one of the main draws of using magic in the first place. So we're gonna do a feature scatter between exist and lingo one, just like we did earlier. And let's now compare them. Okay. So, Rather than having everything basically zero in the whole data set, we now have some actual potential correlations occurring here. We can, at the very least, see um, 
you know, the, the male and female on the exist axis. Um, but you can also see that there's probably some sort of relationship here occurring with at least lingo one. Okay, there's probably another one we could choose except for uh, that's not exist. So let's choose neat one instead. And let's see uh, if that produces something even more interesting. And so those probably should have been correlated, not exist though. Yeah, um, well, at the very least, we can see here our relationship between our Alzheimer's um, and controls and these two genes, NEAT and LINGO. Can we look at exist in the males after magic? That is a great idea, actually. Yeah, oh yeah, because it might have done some shenanigans because it was trying to make everything nice and orderly. So let's do that. Um, let's do features exist and we'll do, um, so I'm just gonna copy and paste from what I had earlier. I'm not even taking my own advice at this point. Um, okay. Okay, so if you recall, uh, we already looked at this earlier. Okay, uh, oh, there it is, all right, great. We looked at this early in the original swear out object. Now we're gonna look at it as well in swear out magic with the potential problem that what might've happened is that, yeah, that's not good. <laughs> All right. Um, does anyone want to unmute or put in the chat what the problem here might be? Anyone except for Wes? Yeah, really good point. Really good point. Hey, uh, extra reasons not to just blindly apply magic to things. <laughs> Really good point. Okay, so basically um, what we noted earlier was that exist should only be present in female cells, right? And that's kind of the point, like exist is all about X inactivation. It's only gonna be in biologically female cells. All right, so that's why we see this very clear cut thing here where Females have this, males don't, no matter what cell type you're looking at. Come down here to our imputed data, we actually see that the males now, for some reason, seem to uh, express exist. As Wes pointed out, this can happen because when you impute data, one of the assumptions you're making is that your neighbors are actually, um, yeah, ex it's actually what Ramesh just said. So male microglia were influenced by neighboring female microglia. Exactly, yeah. Your neighbors influence you, regard and, and um, fate is is blind. Or sorry, not fate. Uh, magic is blind. Out of the box is blind to sex, right? So if you've got two microglia that are next to each other, one's male and one's female, well, it's still going to impute missing values, which in this case included exist. Pretty, which is pretty funny. Um, okay, there are ways I think that you can deal with this. I think you can actually uh, force it to consider some sort of blocking factor, um, but I'm honestly not sure how, and it's, I don't think in the default options in the R implementation. So uh, might be better to do males and females separately, uh, impute them separately, or just simply not impute at all. There's definitely places where that's just not at all appropriate. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna put this in the chat since, in case anyone else wants to run that. Okay, so um, I, I probably have been giving a bad impression of this group. They're really fantastic and the tools they made are incredible. It's just, just like any tools though, they have limitations and you have to keep that in mind. Anytime you're doing anything, there are gonna be limitations and assumptions that your methods make that are sometimes inappropriate. All right, so let's go ahead and run this now with fate. And if we recall, fate is an embedding approach. So what you're doing is you are just like you map or teasing, you're finding a two dimensional representation of your data set that can account for global and local structure. And just like with magic, you can actually see it's doing the same things. They were able to um, fall back on the magic code base when they wrote fate quite a bit. Um, the only thing that's really new that's coming out of this is this landmark operator SVD K means. And then I think the multi dimensional scaling is the last part that might be new. 
And of course, the point isn't to impute things anymore. Okay, so hopefully that didn't take terribly long. Basically, the object this creates is a, a list. Whew. Oh, all right, never mind. Uh, it creates a list. Um, and that list contains a few things in it. Um, one of those things is the actual embedding. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. And uh, if we look at it here, we can see basically it's got fate one and fate two. These are our two fate dimensions we just created. And it's got all the cells in order. And so now to add this back to our, um, to our swear out object, all we have to do is simply run these two lines and we're just adding back those values as the new columns fate one and fate two. And now what's kind of cool is that you can um, use the feature scatter in order to plot this. Okay. So we can now compare directly our UMAP to our fate. And fate probably looks a little bit ugly, and that's because it kind of is if you do it on a, a heterogeneous data set like this. Um, but if we were really able to dig, out, dig, dig down into the subclusters, we would probably find that it was telling us some really interesting things. Um, I really just wanted to show you how to do it in the first place, because um, when the situation is right, this is an amazing, amazing approach. Both of them are when the situation is right. Um, it's just that on this particular data set, Neither of them seem to have performed in a stellar manner, unfortunately. Okay, um, so I, I want to just go ahead and finish up now and recap what we've talked about so far. So we've now talked about single cell RNA-seq versus bulk RNA-seq. We've talked about single cell RNA-seq wet lab processing, basic upstream and downstream quality control, normalization scaling PCA, uncovering data set structure with clustering and embedding, cell type annotations, marker genes, and cell differential gene expression, different types of plots for a single cell RNA-seq, cell cycle scoring, module scoring, graph signal processing, differential state analysis and pseudo-bulk, and, um, well, trajectory analysis. Um, at this point, we've covered a large number of topics, really more than I probably should have thought was reasonable for six weeks. But again, this is a small part of a much, much larger universe. And the crazy thing about this universe is that it's still new. It's, it's still a bit of the Wild West out there. And the point of this workshop wasn't to teach you everything, because one, that would have been impossible, and two, you didn't need to know everything in order to start. We talked about this. These are the basics. That's what we've given you here. And now it's up to you. Where you go from here is going to be dictated by the biological questions you want to answer. And it's also going to be dictated by how the field evolves over time and then how you get to be a part of that field evolving. You've got the basics, which means now you get to be a contributing member of the field. And that's really exciting and it's really scary. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about next steps. So first of all, there's an optional project where you're free to do it if you want to. There's no specific due date for it. Um, it's on GitHub now. So if you want to get started, you can anytime. Um, I've actually got the, I'm going to put the link. I don't think I actually put the link on the website yet. Um, I'm going to put the link on the website. But if you go to the GitHub repo for the workshop, it's in this final project folder here. OK, and there's a whole description here. There is a data set that comes from this paper. It's all about unraveling subclonal heterogeneity in triple negative breast cancer with single cell. It's a really, really interesting early single cell data set that um, you can actually find a lot of really interesting stuff from. So I've included the counts that they uh, derived from SmartSeq. So they did SmartSeq. Uh, as opposed to single, uh, as opposed to 10x genomics, and they quantified with RSEM. Um, so there's a couple things that come along with that, but the main thing is that um, the counts are not whole numbers. You can treat them like they are, though. You can treat them the same way. There's really no difference there. Um, it's just the the algorithm they used is slightly different. Um, there's also the metadata here, and then of course the description. 
there's a set of metastasis gene sets that I included that actually came from that paper that um, I want you to use. And basically the way this is gonna work is that you have to answer these questions. And they're basically questions that a PI might give to you if you've got a PI who wants you to do this analysis. And these are some suggested steps that I wrote in to help you get started, but I'm not giving you the answers in any sense at all. Um, okay, now this is entirely optional and there's no specific due date. And the reason for that is because if you feel like it would be valuable to you to do this project and get feedback from me, and I'll go back and forth with you. And if there's something that you would need to do that you haven't done, I will tell you that. And I'll basically treat you the way that um, like a PI would treat you, um, where I'm basically saying, you know, this doesn't answer my question yet, or this doesn't answer my question yet. So you can get a real world idea of what it would be like to do an actual project like this in a lab. But that's not going to be something everyone needs. So if you don't want to do that, um, you don't have to. There's no time requirements, and you can always come to my office hours, and you can always email me about it. Um, but that's a service I want to offer to everyone who's here, who's doing this workshop, because it's something that I've never seen anyone offer before. And frankly, I think that getting a sense of what doing a real project is like is really the only way to solidify the skills you you learn in a workshop. But that being said, there's other things you can do. So what you really need to do more than anything, whether or not you do that project, what you really need to do is keep moving, find projects to practice on, get feedback from mentors, and you can always come to our club to do that, to try trying and developing new approaches and communicate with your fellows. So, um, okay. <laughs> Wes asks, does the project also come with sleep deprivation, anxiety, and the imposter syndrome of real academia? Fortunately, no. <laughs> Well, yeah, I really shouldn't have said, I'll treat you like a PI would treat you, because for some people, that's actually really, really not a good thing. Um, I will treat you how I would want to be treated by a PI if I was in a project, <laughs> how a PI should treat you. Um, okay. So, the other thing I want to mention is that um, we have postdoc positions available at our institute. They're on the website now. At least one of them is. I'm going to put the other up in the next couple of days, hopefully. Uh, we're also starting this new thing called this Bioinformatics Research Network. It's something that I've been piloting um, with the help of a few other people, and it's just now getting off the ground. Basically, the way this works is that volunteers from all over the world can work remotely together. They can collaborate on open uh, open projects, and they're typically related to bioinformatics, which is how we're able to do it remotely. Um, I organized these. I've been doing this for six months now, and it's been really incredible. And we've now reached the point where we're ready to open it up to more projects and more people participating. So if you've got any interest in that, either to join a project or to open up a project you have for that sort of open collaboration, um, then I'm happy to talk about how that would work. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to basically get you started. I've been serving as project manager for the most part for these projects. So I'm happy to continue doing that until we have a clear system set up where it's self-sustaining. But that's pretty much it. So um, hopefully you enjoyed the workshop. Um, hopefully this was beneficial to you. And um, I'm really happy to keep talking and take any questions at this point. But I'm also happy to keep talking. You've got my office hours. You can come anytime and you can ask me questions. Um, so feel free to do that. So, okay, at this point, are there any questions? Okay, well, um, then that being said, I really appreciate you all so much for coming to this workshop. This is the first time we've ever done this, and I, I'm really excited by the turnout and the engagement. So um, we'll be doing more workshops in the future. I've got your email, so I will email you for doing a new workshop. If you want to help out with any future workshops, uh, just send me a message, and I would really love to have 
anyone here who wants to take like a guest lecture or even talk about running something larger. Uh, I'm very open to other people working together on this. But yeah, thank you all so much. And uh, I'll stick around for another minute or so to see if anyone has any additional questions. But if you don't, then feel free to uh, to head out. And yeah, thank you all for being here. Okay, well, I think that probably does it then. All right. Um, thank you all so much for being here and um, hope to see you again in a future workshop. Feel free to reach out anytime. All right. Y'all have a good one.